Um, so my name is Jeremy Allison. I'm the co-creator of Samba, which is the open source free software SMB um, authentication file server. Um, ha does has lots of different uh, lots of different pieces to it. My day job is I work for Google, and uh, just to be absolutely clear and upfront, this is not a Google-sponsored presentation. In fact, if anyone asks me any questions about Google, uh, it'll be, you know, uh, I don't know, um, and I can't answer. So this is a purely uh, Samba presentation. Uh, as you can see by the uh, Samba-badged presentation here. Now, having said this, um, this is basically a, a an older presentation I had, which I normally give to storage vendors who want to work with Samba, who are kind of like, how do we use this free software stuff anyway? Um, so this presentation isn't terribly technical, but to be honest, I I'm expecting this presentation to just sort of start us going, and then a few slides in, all you guys will be shouting and at my throats anyway, at my throat anyway, um, and, and asking questions. So I'm really happy to drill down, change topics, <coughs> throw the presentation to one side, start drawing on the whiteboard about Samba internals, any technical questions, any questions uh, about Samba and how you use it, as, you know, GPL questions, legal questions, um, you know, development questions, how we test it, you know, what's the deal with your relationship with Microsoft, anything you want to ask, everything is on the table. Like I say, the only thing I'm not going to talk about is Google. So, so other than that, um, so Samba has, has been around a long time. Um, you know, uh, people are kind of like, oh, you guys, yeah, I remember, I used to use you, you're still around? <laughs> you know, I, I, I was saying to uh, someone the other day, it kind of made me feel a little bit like John Travolta after being dis rediscovered by Quentin Tarantino. My Saturday Night Fever days are, are long gone, but, you know, I, I can still do the twist in Pulp Fiction. Um, so, yes, we're, we're still around. Um, we actually released Samba 4.5 last week. Um, <clears throat> and so isn't everything sort of, you know, cloud storage now? This used to be my favourite slide describing cloud storage and the impact it has on the industry, but to be honest, I, 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 in more modern presentations, I've started replacing it with something else. There's a great um, picture from Ice Age, which shows two glaciers coming together, just grinding everything before them and destroying everything in the valley. And, and now I, I think cloud storage, rather than being a boy and his dog atom bomb, is, is more like the ice age, the glaciers coming together and grinding everything. Because it's, it's unstoppable, it's world changing, and it's changing really slowly. <laughs> so, so that's kind of while we're still around. Um, basically because, um, you know, People have a lot of apps out there that don't, aren't cloud native, that don't speak cloud native protocols, that still want to use SMB. Um, you know, I have a 24 terabyte file server at home that I put all my media on. And, you know, there's still a lot of people who want local file storage. And, you know, one of the reasons for that is basically People like local storage for whatever reasons they like to store things that are not necessarily on the cloud. Um, and also, uh, if anyone remembers plugging their, their modems in, the internet speed is not always what it could be. Um, so having cloud storage is great when you've got a fiber link um, and you're living in Japan. I won't say living in Silicon Valley because our internet is terrible. Um, but, but um, you know, uh, uh, cloud storage is great when you've, you know, when you're living in Korea or Japan or somewhere like that, and you actually have a working internet. Um, so without that, having local storage is is still kind of useful. Um, so what are we up to? Uh, we're up to version four. As I say, we just shipped four point five. It is a boatload of different things. So what is Samba? So it's it's all the versions of Microsoft's file sharing protocol. Is there anyone who doesn't know about Microsoft's file sharing protocol? I mean, I know everyone knows of it and uses it, but are there any specific details that you might not know or want to know or, you know? I, I, I did have a, a, a very young engineer uh, who, shall who works for a company sh who shall remain nameless, who at one point said to me, this, this SMB thing, it runs over port 80, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, uh, it doesn't run over port 80. Um, 
So Samba has a lot of things in it. Um, the most useful thing that people, that, that people know most about are the file server piece, and we're committed to implementing all of the SMB3 stuff. We're you know, picking off pieces on the way. Um, it's a clustered file server, so we have a cluster manager, CTDB, uh, which actually will allow uh, multiple Samba front ends to appear as a single seamless file server once we have a coherent um, back end, shared file system, uh, distributed file system back end. Um, the thing that's, it's a print server for my sins. Um, I still get to fixed print bugs. Um, I, I wish it would just die. Die. <laughs> the print server piece is, is, is the most hated piece of, uh, of Samba, I think. Um, whoever starts Samba, you know, whoever starts in the Samba team, the new guy gets to fix printing bugs for five months or whatever and, 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 until they've earned their spurs. Um, and then what's interesting is now it's an Active Directory compatible domain controller. And um, there were a couple of others. There was Luke Howard's Zad, uh, Novell had one. Uh, they ended up buying Zad, I think. Um, I believe that we're the only alternative source for Active Directory left. And we actually work, um, which is amazing to me. Um, you know, because th this is the part of Samba I know least about technically. Um, but I I'm, I'm getting dangerous fixing the code in there now. Um, and that is a boatload of technologies put together um, to make Active Directory work. It's actually a very complex beast. Um, but Amazon ship uh, Samba 4 Active Directory domain controllers in their cloud. So you can spin up uh, an Amazon Samba 4 AD. It's also a set of libraries. Uh, and th these are actually incredibly useful. There are, we have some core libraries, uh, Taluk, which is basically uh, um, Clever hierarchical memory allocation for C, so it's like C++ without guns, knives, or bombs, as, as uh, Tridge used to put it. Um, you, get, you get destructors. You can basically create mem big memory hierarchies, attach functions to each of them, and when they, you destroy the memory hierarchy, all the destructors run, and all, all of Sam modern Samba is built with this thing. And that's actually very widely used outside of Samba. Um, there are some database technologies. Um, TDB and LDB, they're also used outside of Samba. CTDB is the clustering libraries, that's not used so much outside. And the one that's actually getting more and more use now is our asynchronous event subsystem called T-Event. And that's actually being picked up by quite a bit of free software that's shipping in Red Hat. Because um, it's really easy to use. Um, we recently added threading support so you can have multi-threaded T-Event servers. And, have a front end that does asynchronous processing, hands things out to a thread pool, etc. And this is actually the way that most things are done inside Samba now. So even though we still look like the old single process architecture, inside those processes there's loads and loads of thread pools doing lots of things asynchronously. And then of course there's a Linux kernel client, um, which is done by Steve French um, and others. And right now it's still SMB1 and I think I think SMB2 is kind of experimental moving to uh, production right now. So, so who are we and, and you know, <clears throat> so it's a little out of date. Um, so, so the Samba project itself is a member of the Software Freedom Conservancy, which is an umbrella group. Um, I'm actually on the board of directors of the SF Conservancy. It's the umbrella group that basically holds our finances. It gives us a legal existence. For the very longest time, probably about 20 years or so, Tridge and I um, were not big fans of corporate organization. So Samba was just a bunch of guys and women, you know, sort of co collaborating and building things. But eventually, uh, especially around the time of the EU lawsuit, um, we ended up needing um, a little bit more formal organization. So we kind of incorporated under the Software Freedom Conservancy. So, so we're like a division, really, of, of the Software Freedom Conservancy. Wine, the Windows emulator, is, uh, or not an emulator, is uh, another project under the Conservancy, and as are many others. Um, so, where most, a lot of the people working on Samba, there are a few volunteers. A lot of the, a lot of us, a bit like Linux, really, are fully employed to work on Samba. I mean, that's what Google pay me to do, is to work uh, full time on Samba. Um, the th interesting thing about Samba is that, for some reason, I don't know, I don't know what it is. A lot of us have stayed there for a long time. So Tridge, the original founder of Samba, has retired. He now runs the Ardu Pilot. Um, 
the Audio Pilot project, the, the drone stuff. But a lot of others, sort of myself, Volker, who, who we were patch, patch set number one, patch set number two in, after the original code release, um, we're still here. Uh, and, and so we have a lot of history. So it's kind of funny sometimes when we go up to Microsoft these days and chat with the engineers because we're actually older than most of the Microsoft engineers working on the same stuff. And, you know, occasionally they'll say, you know, in SMB1, when we do so-and-so, do you know why we might have? Because <laughs> the, the people who did that originally at Microsoft have long since retired and gone, and live, gone to live in a private island somewhere off the coast of Seattle. You know? um, but we're still around because we're free software people and we're all poor. Um, yeah, so, so we have a lot of long-term members who've been working on this, this code for a very long time. Um, so is, what is it? Is it a product? You know, can you buy, go out and buy Samba, or, or is it a, a set of technologies you build things out of? And it's both. Yes, is the answer to that question. Um, so it, it's really, I, I like to think of Samba as a, a spectrum of, of technologies around SMB3. Uh, and lots of people use it in many different ways. Um, uh, even competitors use it, uh, people who work on Samba use it. So, you can treat Samba as a plug and play, integrate it, forget. A lot of the small NAS vendors tend to do that. They have a, their Samba person who downloads the latest release, puts it in, QAs it, and they just ship the thing. Or, you know, you'll st stick it in a router or some embedded box and, and off it goes and you can forget about it. Um, you know, going up the chain, you get to a semi-customizable solution where you get people who actually understand the code a little more, can change it, can tweak it to do things, all up to the way to the top, excuse me, where you can get basically very large vendors who have products that are based on Samba, uh, obviously with a lot of value add on the back end, and they understand it completely, make changes to it. You know, we, we have, they are the, the people who actually, um, you know, comprise the Samba team itself, really, is the, the top end. Um, people who use it as a technology kit of parts to build things. Um, so, as I said, it's uh, SMB file serving is really a commodity. Um, nobody, you know, would start a business to say, I'm going to do great SMB file serving, because um, it's kind of expected that you have great SMB file serving. It's not something, it's not a feature that you would sell on. You sell now on something else. I have great cloud integration. I'm faster than anyone else. You know, I have, Pretty you know, re re oh. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I have a story about that. Uh, when I was at HP, we actually had a print server uh, product. Uh, that we almost turned into a platform. Uh, it ended up being killed. Uh, these were in the bad old days. Um, but that thing was, um, it, it was replaced um, with a, a Windows-based uh, product. And that was, the, uh, that was the, the way things were going, which they never shipped. Uh, and you can, you can guess as to why they had problems shipping at. Uh, whereas we were running on, a, I believe it was a 512 megabyte single board embedded system. Um, and uh, yeah, funnily enough, they, they couldn't get the replacement solution to work on that. Um, but yes, people have sold Samba as, as print solutions. I believe, uh, and you can, you can see this from the mailing list, I think Xerox also ship SMB client inside their printers wow. um, for uh, access to um, fetching and, and pushing uh, files to and from their printers. So yeah, um, yes, print, even print. Um, so, you know, the people who use it embedded, um, they tend not to have file serving. F they, file serving is an, is an add-on that people kind of want. In fact, they, the funniest use of that, because um, now Tridge is retired, um, he told me that uh, um, somebody was creating a, a drone and he has this drone code autopilot project and somebody said, can you, can you put Samba on the system so that people can copy their photos and, and videos to and from the drone? And he said, I almost downloaded the source code and built it. And then he thought, no, <laughs> best not get tempted. It's like an alcoholic. You can't have just one drink. He said, no, no, I'll just, I'll just use the package from the distribution we're using and I'll, I'll use that instead. <laughs> he, he, he knew that if, he'd ever, if he ever downloaded the source code again as uh, from the Godfather, you know, once you get, uh, what is it? Once you get out, you can never, uh, once you're in, you can never get out. Yeah. Um, so, 
I mean, think about that. A yeah, drone it, it, that you could fly to somebody and then yeah. access, you know, your files. Oh, sure. I, I mean, no, you no, could actually a, a have drone a... drone with a printer on it. You, well, <laughs> you, could have a, you could have a Samba server uh, literally load files onto the drone, send it, fly over to someone's house, it would attach their Wi-Fi, and you would download stuff. I mean, yeah. there's nothing more I mean, private. Use, use, encrypt, awesome. use encrypted SMB3, and it's an absolutely secure way of transferring files. And if you ran uh, the Active Directory, you guys could, you could make a, um, a whole fleet of drones. You could have like Cylons, <laughs> right? And they could all, uh, yeah, they could all share files, which is exactly what the Cylons plan was. Flight of developers. This, this is why, this is why Galactic had no network systems, if you'll remember. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's true. Gal that's right. They had, they, they yes. had no network systems because they didn't want. They knew Cylons what could happen. Using Samba. If you, if you get Samba involved, drones. there's, yeah. Interestingly enough, we, we have had lots of security issues, um, but to be honest, you, you can say, well, you guys are just shitty coders, and that's why you have problems. But um, I, I don't think we have a... There's a slide later on in this presentation that actually goes into some of the security validation we do. So I, I, don't, I, I don't think we're great, but I don't think we're any worse than, than anyone else, if you know what I mean. I, I think we... Uh, compare very favorably with with most proprietary code. Uh, in fact, all proprietary code, I would say. Um, it's just that writing secure code is really hard, and especially when you're working with a protocol that has so many moving parts, it's really, really hard to, to get these things right. Um, so, I mean, you know, the recent, the recent bad lock thing, uh, which lots of people laughed at, um, mainly because they didn't understand it, um, was a, a wonderful example of that, uh, where that was actually a problem that was uh, in every single vendor's code because it was a protocol level problem, not, a, uh, not an implementation problem. But we can go into that later if you like. Um, so doing this stuff right is hard. Anyway, so then we have uh, mid-level users, and there are a lot of the, the distro people. And, and so for those guys, you know, they don't really sell interoperability and storage, although you know Red Hat and Suzy uh, and um, Solaris now now do. Um, but it, it is a core part of the product. People expect it to be there. They expect it to work. You know, and you expect to be able to take your Windows boxes and and connect to it. Um, and then, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the desktop systems use libsme client. An interesting thing uh, recently, you know, the, the one Google thing I can talk about is that recently um, Chrome, uh, the Chromebooks shipped a port of libsme client onto Chromebooks, so you can now download that extension, and that's an official Google port. You can actually download that extension and connect to uh, Windows um, file shares from your uh, from your Chromebook. Um, and then, of course, the Linux distros have the uh, kernel client built in. And then you have kind of the uh, mid-level vendors. Now a lot of those people don't necessarily want the file serving piece, but they actually have uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of these devices, they need to integrate with Active Directory. And so that's something that we do really, really well. We have a piece called WinBind, um, which is basically a little daemon that will sit there on a, a Linux system or Unix system, will join an Active Directory um, domain, will change the password, and it can basically do pass-through. So you can, have, you can have users that authenticate, it will fetch Kerberos tickets for them, it will keep them up to date. You know, it's, it's basically the plugin authentication piece that connects Unix and Linux systems into a Windows Active Directory. Man, I did that. So many years ago, I remember using WinBind to ah. join Linux, to have to do password authentication from Linux to AD. Yeah, well, it still wow. works. <laughs> it's, it brings back memories. It, it, I mean, it's you know, we we add more scalability features to it every year. It's you know, it, I, I was just working on some bugs on that, um, basically to cut down on the. Uh, latency issues last week, in fact. Um, so um, that, that's actually uh, that's actually very widely used, e even if the rest of Samba isn't. Um, you know, and, and these the people who use that, they tend to have they use using custom versions of Samba. They have their own their own trees and QA, and and most of them have a relationship with with Samba. You know, the the organization. And then you've got the really high end guys, um, <coughs> who basically. Take the source code, absolutely customize the hell out of it. And one of the, um, 
really interesting ways, I'm, I'm moving over to the whiteboard now, one of the really interesting things that you can do with Samba is here you've got your client talking SMB3, two or three, let's say, and here you're talking to SMBD. The interesting thing about SMBD, and has been for a long time, is that it never talks to the file system, and that sounds quite strange for a, a file serving daemon. What it actually does is we have an extremely well defined VFS layer. And so anything that touches the file system is basically a plug-in library. So for the POSIX file system on, on Linux or whatever we call it VFS default. And that's built in. Right? But any access goes through here onto the file system Samba never, SMBD never touches the file system itself. So, because of that, other people have built Ceph, Gluster, and there are in fact quite a few proprietary um, plugins there that talk to distributed file systems, you know, uh, of various um, various other vendors. I, I don't want to name them, um, you know, but there are a lot of people who've built plugins. Now, interestingly enough, this, this piece needs to be GPL'd because it's built into Samba, but the thing that it's talking to doesn't necessarily need to be GPL'd. Um, so that's, when, when people take Samba and they use it as their SMB engine, that's usually the way that they use it. And I actually, part of my job, because there's so many of them here in the Valley, is a lot of the time, you know, I'll bring them to Google for lunch or I'll go down to their offices or whatever, and I'll go through a design of how they can do this to make their product work. Um, because the thing is, you know, as I said earlier, when you're building a storage product, you don't, SMB isn't your value add. Everyone just expects it, it has to be there, it has to work, but nobody's going to pay for it. What they're paying for is the clever stuff that you're doing at the back end, right? So we give them a way to essentially outsource the complexity of doing all the AD integration and the SMB3 stuff and the encryption and NTLM and you name it, whatever, and the SMB3 parsing. And what we give them is a really simple interface that looks pretty much like a mixture of POSIX and Windows. And you can just plug in anything you like there and, and build yourself a, a back-end storage product. And a lot of people do that. It, it seems to work really well. So Jeremy, on that, yeah. um, if somebody was building a distributed um, environment, yep. would your daemon communicate with other daemons running on other nodes? Uh, yes. Well, so, so, this is where, so this is where CTDB comes in. So we have a, pl a plug-in library called dbwrap, which then talks to the CTDB pre protocol DB, and this then, so this is one single node with lots of these things running, lots of SMEDs, and then other nodes, the CTDBs talk on a backplane between themselves. So you run so, one SMBD per connection? Yes. Yes. So you have one SMBD per connection, um, unless you're doing multi-channel um, where you can, so with multi-channel... But the client might have more than one coming in. That's right, you have a, another SMBD, what this guy does, it says, is there someone here who already know, has that connection, then he hands it over and dies. Um, and so you can sometimes end up with multiple. And this guy internally has multiple threads handling the I.O. and the stuff that goes into the file system. And so this, this VFS interface is changing from a synchronous sort of do the right to a send receive model where the VFS, you get up calls from the VFS modules that basically and say, hey, I've done the asynchronous thing you asked me to, give me something new to do. And who synchronizes the um, multiple SMBDs between, uh, or do they all use the same VFS or they, they run their own unique VFS? They, they run their, they run unique, uh, well, normally to have a coherent view of the file system across the cluster, everybody would be running the same VFS right. modules on the same, for the same shares. You could have, you could have different shares, you could have one share that was talking to Ceph, one share that was talking to Gluster. But that's share. where you'd serialize the file system of any one yes. particular plugin. Per, okay. per share, yeah. basically. And then basically the, the CTDB backplane um, is used to communicate things like, if I have a Word file open on this node and, and another node over here wants to open the same Word file, you know, do you get the same, you do get the message, someone else has this open. And that, that basically is done via communication via CTDB. 
Notify is another one. If somebody creates a file in a directory and someone else on another node has a notify on it, then you need to be able to send the asynchronous message back saying, hey, somebody created a file here, you need to refresh your Windows Explorer. And do you, do you do that on demand or do you distribute that lock between nodes? So, so each, the, the way it works is, um, uh, at least when you're using CTDB, the, the, all of the access to the locking databases um, essentially is local when you're talking to, when clients are talking on the same node, when you have to go off node. So there, there's basically, there's, um, um, there's something called the record owner. So the record, um, you negotiate with CTDB saying for this file, this node is going to be the owner. Right. And therefore anyone accessing on this node gets local access. Someone coming in from another node who's accessing the same file, they have to do an off node <coughs> request. And then basically there's some heuristics inside CTDB that basically say, well, if this guy's asking for it so many times, then let's just transfer the ownership over here right. so this thing can go. You know. um, interestingly enough, the, interf the VFS interface is rich enough such that if you want to, and there are some distributed file system vendors who do, if your distributed file system is good enough, most of them aren't, but if your distributed file system is good enough, you can actually dispense with CTDB and this uh, locking in mechanism, and you can move all of that into the back end. Right, yeah. so, so the VFS is rich enough so that you can do it via DB wrap and CTDB, or you can do it directly via the VFS module, uh, depending on how good your back end file system is. So, you know, there are, there are some people who say, ah, we have our own distributed lock management, let's let, we'll take care of all that. So it's flexible enough to work both ways. So this is when you, you get your high-end users. <clears throat> so, you know, you've got your cloud gateways, clustered object storage gateways, high-end NAS, um, you know, uh, people running Active Directory domain. And, and those are the people who basically, um, they employ Samba team members. And, you know, they're, they're the ones who have the most interesting legal and licensing issues, you know. Um, excuse me. And we have lawyers available, with, and often I'll sit down, and a, a lot of the time people are just want to want to say, hey, if we design it like this, are you going to sue us? Or, you know. <laughs> and the, the answer is always no, but, you know, it, it's nice to explain to them that no, we're not litig litigious, you know, we want you to use it. We've actually made changes to the VFS for vendors so that they can, it makes it easier to use with their proprietary products. So, you know, we're... Uh, oh, in fact, <coughs> aha, yes, there we are. Um, so, yeah, so uh, that was before um, Red Hat bought Ink Tank. So, you know, here are a couple. There's, like I said, there's lots of uh, proprietary stuff. And, um, so this, this always amused me. <clears throat> we have a, a yearly conference, Samra XP, in Germany, and somebody came up to me from a from an AS vendor at a point uh, at the end of the conference, and he said, "Wow, I'm I'm really surprised. Yeah, you guys, everybody thinks that you're these, you know, rabid weasels of free software, and you you hate proprietary software, or whatever. And you're the most business friendly people I've ever met. You know, whoever does your PR utterly sucks. And of course, that was mostly me at the time. So. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, point point noted. Um, yeah, I, I think it's probably because we went to GPLv3 pretty early that people, and, and Apple went, oh, we can't do that. That's, you know, we, we, we have religious objections to GPLv3. That people think that we're some sort of, you know, psycho uh, zealots. And, uh, and actually, we're really not. <laughs> um, you know, um, we just, you know, our code, yes, it's nice to be GPL. The other stuff, we don't really care that much. So, um, you know, a lot of people say, well, I'd love to use Samba, but I have this proprietary piece. And it's like, well, that really isn't a problem um, most of the time. Um, you know, we have yet to find someone who we couldn't um, come to an accommodation to make some code changes or whatever to work with their proprietary backend with Samba as the front end. Um, it, I mean, it might be harder than they want to do. It, you know, it might be, well, we already have this stuff and we just want to link it in and therefore we're going to write our own or buy another one or whatever. Um, you know, it might be more work than they want to do, but there's always a way to make this work, um, to work with um, proprietary vendors, basically. Um, 
So, you know, we, as I say, we will change our code to aid integration with proprietary code. But so long as it's an improvement. So th this is the thing <coughs> I, I keep telling people. It's like, look, if you create a VFS module whose sole purpose, you know, is to have a VFS hide from the GPL, you know, call one, hide from the GPL, call two, or whatever, this is probably not going to work. So what I, what I like to say to them is, look, if you have a distributed file system and you need to access this via NFS, which most of them do, design your interface such that it's not Samba specific. Design the interface, the back-end interface that the VFS talks to, <coughs> it's good for NFS and it's good for SMB3. If you design it like that, then it's basically a generic system interface and you know my view is that the Samba GPL boundary stops there. So you don't need to release any code <coughs> in that proprietary library that's providing that standardized interface. You only need to release the code that goes into Samba that will talk to that. Uh, and that mostly works. Uh, you know, like I say, I've, I haven't come across anyone who's, who's been able, who's thought that was unreasonable or was unable to work with it or whatever. There are people who didn't want to do the work, and that's fair enough, but, you know, it, it, there's always a way. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, never, um, it's, it's never an intractable legal problem. It's always a technical issue of do you want to do it like that or, you know, do you have an easy way that you want to do it? So, um, as I say, we're, we're not particularly hostile to proprietary code. We just prefer to do our code as free software. Um, so how to fail. This is great. Um, I have some wonderful stories from this. Um, so we, we had one vendor who was unbelievably large. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to mention who they are because it's very embarrassing to them. So Microsoft created a new release of the client. It came out and, you know, as far as I knew, everything was working and I finally, I get this. I, I remember a message coming out on the mailing list from some Hotmail account or whatever saying, oh, uh, we're having problems authenticating. Um, can somebody help? And it's like, ah, oh, you idiots, you probably just configured the back-end <coughs> password database wrong. Uh, delete, next, you know. <laughs> Turns out this was a major, major vendor whose, whose product was just completely broken by Microsoft's latest release. Um, and then they finally got in touch with me directly and called me up and said, help! <laughs> 20 minutes later, I'd, I'd found and fixed the bug. But, you know, they'd been sat on that for two weeks because they thought the, their idea of getting support was sending an anonymous email to the, <laughs> from a Hotmail account to the Samba email <coughs> lists. This is not how you get support. Um, you know, actually knowing who you are and what you're doing and it is, is a great help. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong, I like anonymous users with Hotmail accounts. I have great discussions with them, they help me fix bugs or whatever. But if I know you're a major vendor, you're going to get more attention than, than an anonymous Hotmail account user. Um, so um, other things that people do is, uh, I, and I've seen people, I, I've known vendors who actually gave up on Samba and said, well, this didn't work. And I'm like, well, did you tell us about it? Well, no. <laughs> you know, it, it must have been a common bug because we, we ran into it. And it's like, well, n no. We'd never heard of that bug before, and you'd never told us, so how would you expect us to fix that for you? Um, yeah, so that's another one, is silently hope. So, so those people are, are really funny. They sit there, and they wait for the next release, and then they just look at the release notes and say, did my bug get fixed? Like, this is not the way to successfully uh, use things. And then the other guys who fail miserably are the ones who... They, these guys usually end up using Samba and they don't know it because what happened was there's a chain of OEMs licensing stuff from licensing stuff and they ended up with Samba via some chain of third-party software that they didn't know they had. Um, usually, usually from um, uh, some anonymous Asian country <laughs> who shall remain nameless because I don't want to be nasty. Uh, but yeah, that, that's another way um, of things not working. Um, <coughs> more, more ways to fail is say, all oh, this licensing stuff is too hard, let's not bother with that. Um, you know, which actually, because <laughs> I work in Google's open source programs office, so this is, you know, people who say, oh, this licensing stuff is too hard, they're trying to put me out of a job. <laughs> so if nobody bothered with licensing, why would anyone employ an open source program office? Um, so yes, um, licensing is important at least try and do, um, obey your GPL obligations that are extremely easy to do. Um, 
there's there's not any you know it, it's just a matter of put the source code that you're using out there it really isn't that hard especially with GPL v3 it actually makes it easier because if you're not if you haven't modified it that much you can just point directly to the Samba code on the on the website and that's good enough um, and then you know um, not talking to us. Who needs the Samba team? Yeah, they, they can't know anything about this stuff. They only write it after all. Um, you know, aren't they communists? No point talking to them. Um, and then the other one is, is uh, and I've run across this recently, it's like, yeah, this, this Samba's great. Uh, unfortunately, we're still on 3.6 because we have 100,000 lines worth of changes <laughs> that we haven't figured out how to forward port yet. And it's, Okay, so let, let's start feeding your patches in, please. Um, and I yeah. imagine that last bit is very, very common, because I've heard of that happening with a lot of these OEMs where they're running a very outdated version of Samba. Yeah, it, it, it's... In it, fact, I've had personal experience yeah, yeah, with systems. It, and, and, people, and then people say, well, Samba sucks because it doesn't connect to modern Windows clients. It's like, well, yes, it does if it's a modern version. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah... It, I mean, there's tons of them still using Samba. Well, screen. a lot of those are abandonware, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so you tend to get that when people put Samba in a product and then the product's discontinued or they run the other version <coughs> and they're never going to update that. I mean, that's a generic <coughs> problem in the industry is abandoned wear on, on, you know, devices that never get updated. So most of the, most of the big vendors are much, much better about this. Um, you know, they, they feed things back. They know how to, you know, they, they know that the changes they need need to go back upstream. Because it, it, in the long run, it reduces their porting burden. Excuse me. Um, so one of the things we do uh, to make their lives easier is our VFS layer, we guarantee ABI stability between major versions. So, you know, for 4.4 or whatever, you can guarantee you can take any of the 4.4 series, you can take a VFS module compiled for any of them, and it will still work on all of the 4.4 series. We, will, we do make changes, and sometimes quite big changes in the VFS layer, but we only do that inside major releases. So that's, that's the way we try and keep things as stable as possible for OEMs and people who want to use it. Um, you know, we've been doing this a long time, and so you know, we've gotten used to how people want to do things. And <coughs> to be honest, the, the people who fail have already failed, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and, and the people who are still with us have, have gotten... They're getting better. They're getting to the point where they, they know how we're working. They know how we're supposed to work. Uh, but communication is the key. Uh, I would rather hear, you know, very early about someone who's trying to do something and having it fail miserably than hear about it after they've spent a year's worth of effort trying to make things work and, and find that, you know, we needed to make a fundamental VFS change for them or something. Because um, we'll do that. We just need to know. How does your relationship with Microsoft work? I mean, bearing in oh, mind... Oh, so, so this is... The, so, uh, so the, the question. question. <laughs> the question. How's the relationship with Microsoft? So, so as our relationship with Microsoft is... is absolutely great um it used to be really really bad um <laughs> like you know suing each other bad and um i don't know whether you've noticed but microsoft really needs linux these days <laughs> mm. and 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 we're a big part of interoperability um so i mean i have been the powershell port i have been helping those guys out doing some linux coding basically just not actually doing the code for them, but giving them, telling them how to do things. They know how to do things on Windows. They've got this code, they want to make it work on Linux. And but Microsoft like, haven't got any Linux. No, they have, they, they, they do. But what you have to remember is they're a very large company. They have lots and lots of uh, engineers who've only ever used Windows or last used or last used okay, Linux so 20 the, years ago. It's a mindset rather than... Yeah, and, and they, they just <laughs> don't know how to do things on a modern Linux. So, for instance, you know, uh, there was a feature in, in Linux that is very similar to that of Windows. They didn't know it existed. They didn't know how to do it. I'm not going to say where it is, but, you know, and so it's that kind of thing. I was actually up in Redmond last week um, for an interoperability lab that they ran purely for the Samba team. Uh, and this is just, you know, this is so unheard of. Um, and in fact, let's see. Um, I have a... Um, and, and while he's looking for that, I, I will yeah, support this. So I'm, I'm a, as a Microsoft MVP for storage, I meet with the other side of this conversation. Uh, no, and when I started, it was a little <laughs> different. 
And yeah. now um, Microsoft is really proud of the fact that they invite the Samba team on board to uh, meet with folks, uh, you know, in Redmond. They were really proud of the fact, and they tout the fact that SMB two and three is not the same proprietary nonsense as SIFs. Oh no, they absolutely love the not. The fact that they yeah, are yeah, trying yeah. to create a protocol. <coughs> now, it's not an open protocol. It's Microsoft's protocol. Yep. But they're they love the fact that they're open about it and that they work closely with the third party. <coughs> but it's open in the sense that it's documented. It's completely documented, and right now we are talking about how to extend it to make it work better for Unix to Unix. And they are interested in that effort. They would, I mean, I'm not going to say they're imp going to implement it, I'm not going to say they're, you know, they're going to make it part of the protocol, but they are, we had a, a, an SMB1 Unix extension which was kind of like abandoned where they basically carved out a section of the protocol so these info levels and this these these worlds are yours you know <laughs> trespass no more or anything else so so we, we did it there now they're coming back to us and feeding back saying well we heard you want to do it like this that's not going to work quite right you need to add this and i mean the big meeting last week was how to do this right so what so what happens if they bring out a new feature how long before you know it exists. Well, they have and many, many times. Oh, so, so they, they do that. So, so they, whenever a new feature comes out, we get they um, they will give us advance warning normally, um, and they, they do that for all the vendors. Um, it might not be public, but we'll get advance warning, and most of the time we'll get an advance preview of the documentation of how it's supposed to work. And we can at, at that point we can at least feedback and say, well, that you know that doesn't work, or oh, that's great, um, you know. We actually get some input into the process. Yes, it's still their protocol. Yes, it's still owned by them. But, you know, working with Linux is a big deal for Microsoft right now. So, um, you know, I mean, um, one of the demos that I, I really wanted to get together for the last uh, storage conference, we, we couldn't get it working in time, unfortunately, was, you know that Microsoft have uh, uh, an SMB3 file, file server in the, in the cloud, Azure, the Azure file server. You aware of that, anyone? So, so you can actually mount the Microsoft Azure cloud directly from your Windows machine at home, or now from SMB client. You can do SMB client minus E, you know, Azure file. Um, it, it, they only, uh, I think they only allow it encrypted for now. You can actually connect directly to the Azure cloud and, you know, the GNOME VFS layer in the uh, Linux desktop because uh, it uses libSMB client, we'll be able to talk directly to the Microsoft Cloud uh, and the SMB server in the Microsoft Cloud. So um, we had a few teething problems to do with um, um, SPNAGO negotiations and the security stuff is always hard. But we actually got that working uh, and that's really, really cool. So yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, engineering wise, uh, things have never been better, and, and you know they're getting better all the time. Um, I, I still wish they wouldn't beat people over for software patents, but <laughs> I'm a free software guy, and I think software patents are an abomination anyway. But um, but yeah, in, in terms of engineering, um, yeah, we we get on great actually. So um, do you do you have? Like I, I, a... I actually take them out for me <laughs> for meals, <laughs> the conference dinner. So. But do you have a length of time before you'll support a certain feature? Will you well, it, it depends. Some with, of them, yeah, some of them are really easy. So, for instance, for the SMB3 encryption, we were the first out of the gate. We were the first non-Microsoft implementation to have that. Some of the things like SMB Direct, you need customized RDMA hardware, and so your implementation has to target that. So that kind of thing, you know, it depends on what card you have. So, you know, last week, Metz, one of the, the German Samba team members, he got a demo version of this working and it's checked into some branch somewhere or whatever. So, you know, people who have RDMA hardware built into their NASs, you know, they're gonna be, they're gonna do that implementation faster than we are, um, simply because they have the hardware, they have the test environment. Um, it's a lot, e a lot easier for them. The pure SMB uh, 3, Excuse me. The pure SMB3 protocol features we tend to do quicker because we actually code faster than most <coughs> most of the other vendors because it's kind of easy to throw stuff together. It's when we have to do something. So, for instance, one of the hard things to do is some of the um, the persistent handle state because for that you need a backend file store that can do transaction. You need a transactional backend file store that can store handle state across nodes, and so we have the code for that. But right now. 
it, 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 you need a back end that supports it. Mm. And, and so, you know, uh, uh, SMB3 is used um, as a, it's becoming more popular as a server to server protocol in the back end. I believe that Microsoft uh, do all their Bing Maps stuff uh, against SMB3 servers using SMB Direct. Well, that's what SMB3 so, was intended for. Yeah. I mean, so SMB2 yeah. was more of a client server protocol. Yeah, SMB3, SMB3 server is to server. Absolutely, server to server protocol. Yeah. And there's so, a lot of features in it that do that. So, I mean, we, we implement them. Um, we just added multi channel, um, you know, uh, the SMB Direct is coming. <clears throat> uh, I'm trying to think. Um, the clustering features. Um, yeah, that's being worked on, you know, uh, because it's a volunteer effort, even though these people are funded by um, various companies, you know, we have to coordinate. So, yeah, we're, we can be a little slower on features um, if it's not pure software features. Anything that requires uh, back-end support um, can take a little longer. Yeah. Um, and everything so. in SMB3 is optional, except... Pretty much. The flag that says, do you support SMB3? Yeah. So if you support yeah, SMB2 yeah, yeah. and you support the flag that says, do you support SMB3, then you support SMB3. And, and then it's a question of which of the features do you support. And really the only stack that supports all the SMB3 features is, is Windows. Windows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so true. none of the companies, none of the third party things. Yeah, by definition. Yeah. So, so the way we actually develop some of these is, is very interesting. What we do is whenever we develop a new feature, what we'll do is we'll create client code first. So we want to explore a new feature. We get the documentation from Microsoft, we create client code, and then we run that client code, test it against various versions of Windows. And this is sometimes where we get, we send feedback to the Microsoft doc help team and say, uh, this, you know, your doc say it should work like this, but the actual servers do something slightly different or, you know, so we, there's a lot of feedback there. Um, and so um, we get a client test suite that explores all the features of how the protocol is supposed to work. Then we implement the server piece. So that's how we do it. And right now, um, Samba is such that whenever you <coughs> check in any piece of code, even a documentation fix, it has to run through our full regression test suite from start to finish, which includes spinning up standalone servers, domain controllers, replicated domain controllers, um, you name it, everything and all of the tests are run against every check-in before anything can go into the tree. Um, and we even have a list of tests that we know we are currently failing. And if one of those tests flips, so in other words, if you add a feature and that test starts to succeed, that will be flagged as a failure until you remove it from the known fail file. So at that, and at that point then, OK, we know we passed that and we can never regress again. Um, so that's you know, pretty much how, um, how Samba's developed these days. Um, I, actually, I'm, I was mixing some stuff up. There's, I, the, I have another presentation. Let's just see if it's, is this the one I was thinking of? Uh, no, no, I didn't, I didn't bring it, unfortunately. Um, let's go back to, I have another presentation that, that shows from, um, oh, uh, where were we? Yeah, I have another presentation that shows when we released Samba 4, we actually got a quote from the director of Windows Server Engineering saying <laughs> how great <coughs> it was the, uh, that we were coming out with this thing, which was, you know, which was really cool, actually. I was very, very happy about that. Um, yeah. Um, Who's coming out with it first? I mean, it's, well, so it's, always, it's always Microsoft. So they... They design it, and you're basically reverse engineering it. No, 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 no. No one has to reverse engineer anything anymore. This is one of the reasons why uh, the peculiar Samba mindset of engineers like myself and Volker and whatever were no longer required. <laughs> it used to. It, it, we used to spend have a great deal of fun spending our time reverse engineering. We don't have to reverse engineer anymore. You know, they'll say, "Oh, we're going to put this feature in," and then they'll give us a spec. <laughs> <laughs> so we have no excuse, you know, it's like, oh, okay, no we have fun, to implement. Though. I know, exactly, it's take, I, I, it, part of me misses the good old days of, oh, how does Windows do this? You know, and, and in fact, this was one of the reasons why we developed that test-driven um, methodology, which eventually we got Microsoft to adopt. Um, 
because originally their, their test suites were basically scripted Windows clients doing things that only Windows clients would do. And eventually, after they produced the documentation test suites, they changed their test methodology. What they do now is they create a new document that gets fed into a test team. They take the document, they create a client implementation, and then they run that against Windows servers to make sure that what the document says is actually what the protocol does on the wire. Uh, and that's pretty much what we've been doing for years. Um, and, and so we, we kind of develop in the same way. So are um, you contributing new stuff to it then? I mean, uh, well, yes. Are you, so, are you helping guide <coughs> the next implementation and so, features that are going to be in it there? So, so the, the Unix extensions um, are something that, that um, Sam has a lot of experience with. I, I can't commit, I can't say whether or not they're going to adopt them or not, but they're, they're encouraging us to do so. In fact, they're, I, I am late. Uh, I have a, a, rather than being here, I should be writing Unix specs. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're writing me pretty hard because they want to make sure that, you know, uh, they, they, Unix to Unix will work very well with SMB3. Um, so we, one of, one of the, Interesting things that we're trying to fix at the moment is the protocol level of vulnerability that was discovered by Badlock. Uh, that was something that was discovered by um, METS um, after, after I had a trip up at Redmond. And that's actually a fault in the DCRPC security layer. That's just a fundamental protocol level fault um, uh, that, ne that needs to be fixed. And so he has come, out, he has come up with a protocol revision update that he's proposed uh, as a change. And so we'll see if that gets adopted or not. Um, right, but it's solely up to Microsoft to adopt it. Well, they're the ones with uh, most of the clients. Although Apple um, these days has quite a few clients. You know, it, it's not as, uh, as you know, it, it's not a one client situation that it used to be. But yeah, I mean, obviously they can or uh, adopt it or not. I, th I think we're going to adopt that protocol change anyway because it's a significant security improvement, at least at the base DC RPC layer. Um, and it means that we could, once, once we have that in place and we negotiate the upgraded security, we know that the rest of the, the connection is secure. So that's something we need, I think. And I think um, one, one result of the fact that, that Microsoft is much more forthcoming with the specs for SMB 2 and 3 is that there's a proliferation of clients and servers out there. Yes. And uh, in fact, many of these clients and servers yep. only support SMB 2 and 3 yes. because it's just such a pain to support SIFs. Uh, SMB 1 is very hard to support. Um, in fact, if I, if I were giving advice to people who were yeah. you know, creating stuff from scratch, don't, don't do SMB 1 unless you really have to. Um, I mean, we really have to. I, I, I had a bug the other day from someone who had a DOS 6.0 to something based industrial control system huh. that worked against Samba and I broke it and he was adamant I had to fix it. So, so we did, it wasn't that hard, but you know. Uh, and and I, I still get bugs reports from OS2 clients. Um, and we fix those things, because it's, you know, it's not so hard to do. If they can give us a trace, we can, we can put the code in. So it, it's been very interesting. When we first started Samba, we were uh, originally a DOS type file server. And then Windows NT came out. And so what happened was we originally wrapped the Windows NT layer on top of our old DOS-based implementation. And then over the years, it got turned inside out. So what happened was the core of the Samba became a Windows NT style implementation with a, a DOS layer shim on top. Now that we've moved to SMB3, the same thing has happened again. And so the core of Samba is now an asynchronous SMB3 engine with a thin shim of Windows NT emulation that calls into that. And on top of that, a thin shim of DOS and OS2 layer emulation that calls into that. So it's, I, I like to describe it as trying to fix the airplane while you're flying it. You're trying, to, you're trying to upgrade from a biplane to a 747 while you're keeping it in the air, which is always kind of fun. Now, I know that you know. you're not going to abandon SIFs. But oh no, I'd love to. Others are. I'd love to. Others are moving to an SMB two plus. Oh yeah, world. yeah. No, I, I I very much would like to have a mode where with Samba. In fact, in fact, I think you can now. You can say min protocol equals SMB two, and we won't talk SIFs anymore. Yeah. SMB one. So I mean, we we can do that. We don't ship out of the box like that. But um, I, you can actually do that right now with Samba. Yeah. 
And I, in fact, if you can, I would recommend to do that. I believe you can do that in Windows Server. Uh, well, I, 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 th I, I, I'm, you know, I, I don't. I no, can't. that's not your your product. Yeah, I can't. I, I can't, um, you know, um, comment on on their possible uh, oh, uh, that that you know possible changes. But I'm I'm pretty sure the engineers there would like to ship with only the SMB two client, and you would have to install the SMB one client as an add-on if you needed it. Yeah. That would be a great way to be. And you know, and, and by default now, uh, when you use when you use any of the command line tools in Samba, they negotiate SMB three, and they will fall back to SMB one if if they don't get it. So, which is definitely the way to go, because it's just such a nicer protocol. You can do things faster. You have more features. It's encrypted on the wire. You know, it's well, it can be encrypted on the wire. Um, yeah, it's it's a really nice. Um, both server-to-server -server and client-to-server protocol. And, and, you know, while there are still many, many applications out there that... that I, I have another uh, slide set. Um, in fact, I think this one has the, the picture on it, so I'm going to see if I can... Uh, this was the one I did for Sneer. Um, yes. Ah, he, in fact, here is my... Yeah, that was my cloud storage is the future new, um, and, and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> this is my best description of cloud storage, Mr. Blobby. It's, yeah, it, it, it's a blob store, and, you know, while there are still apps that don't map very well to a blob store, uh, things like Samba, Windows Server, SMB3 are still extraordinarily useful. I mean, you wouldn't design new applications that, you know, had byte range locks in them anymore, because that's crazy. But for existing applications, and to use these things as a gateway into the cloud, um, it's really, really useful. And, and like I say, having a modular architecture where you can rip out bits and stick things in the back end, that's, um, that, that's really the goal. Um, so that, you know, uh, keeps me employed at least for another 10 years or so. <laughs> How much longer do you want to be employed? Uh, well, I actually like doing this. <laughs> I, you know, many people say, oh, you're bored with it. And it's like, well, no, because they, they, they keep, they, they think, I think, that it's the same code all over and over again. The code in Samba now is, is it, it's not even the same animal. It's not even the same, I know, it's, it's not the same protocol. It's not. Be, at some point, there's got to be value for at least faking like you're tired of it. You know, but Not it's one really. of the few people. I love still, it. No, no, but check this out, right? I mean, if if you if you let up, maybe you know, oh God, I'm I might have to pull the plug on this. You might get paid more. No, they probably just say, oh, okay, bye, <laughs> and then I wouldn't get to do it anymore. Uh, no, I really, I mean, I really love working on this stuff. Uh, it, it's fun, and the wonderful thing is, it allows me to work on system level infrastructure that. Ordinarily, you just don't get to touch. I mean, you know, look look at most most engineers. They're working in some kind of Java framework that's, you know, 27 layers above the hardware or whatever. You know, we get to put inside our messaging subsystem raw metal system programming with thread pools sending asynchronous message handling between different processes. I mean, God. Few Steven, people get to Steven do that stuff. Describe you as like a geek's geek or something like I that. I love this. So stuff. true. <laughs> I absolutely love it. I mean, you know, I've had to yeah. fix signal handling bugs inside the event library. Yeah. Do you know how few people can actually write si correct signal handling code these days? I mean, I I, this I do is it. The I, thing I do Google interviews and. Yeah. Well, well, I don't want to give away where my. I have a wonderful uh, set of questions. We weren't going to talk about use. Google. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's right. But I have a wonderful set of questions that I use for that. Very few people understand how signals work, for instance, and stuff like that. It's, I pity yeah. the kid who has to sit down well, across the table from you. That no, they learn something, man. And, and you know what I, you know what I do? I, I ask questions about bugs in Samba. So my questions are always structured around things I have screwed up. So if they get it right, they, they, it's wonderful because they make me feel terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, having said that, if we were to do Samba again, uh, I would never do it in C. Um, C is a horrible language. No one should ever be programming it anymore. No one should ever be writing network-facing code in C ever again. Um, what, what, what would you do it in? Yeah. Uh, so for something where it wasn't utterly speed critical, I would use Go. Yeah. Um, for stuff that was speed critical, Volker is um, 
a Samba team member, uh, he is a big fan of Rust. So those are the two things that, but we've, I mean, everyone has so many problems. We, we uh, I don't know whether you remember Codenomicon and Coverity. Uh, Co Coverity are the static analyzer people, they got bought by, I think they both ended up being bought by the same people, Syn Synopsis. Uh, Codenomicon are the fuzzing guys. Uh, Codenomicon were the people who, who, en who instigated the bug that turned into Badlock, the protocol level bug. Um, which, which, like most of these bugs, starts with a "oh, that's funny," rather than a "eureka moment." Um, anyway, so so they have run they run against us all the time, and we they have some sort of level of quality, kind of, you know, uh, level of uh, we're at the highest level. I know that we're at the highest level because we 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 are continually fed with coverity bugs, uh, and and so we fix those. On an ongoing basis, if you're looking at Git stream, commit stream, you'll see CID, which is Coverity ID, whatever. You'll see bug fixes going in for those. It's been a long time since we had a security hole through one of those, but we, we've, you know, we're, we're not one of those projects that ignores bug reports by whatever means. So we do fuzz testing, we do Coverity analysis, you know, um, we fix bugs from anywhere. Um, yeah, so that's that's really important to us. Yeah, the uh, the uh, the Badlock thing was really interesting. I, I was up in uh, Redmond working with Microsoft, and uh, what happened was uh, I was testing the Active Directory stuff, and uh, Goodnomic and said, "Oh, I, I, we have a new test suite for DCRPC. Why don't you run it against us?" And, and they ran against us, and we crashed immediately. And I'm like, "Oh, great!" You know. So I look into it, and it's a null pointer in direction. M trivial, most common, stupid C error, right? So I'm like, "Oh, okay, this is an easy fix. If not null, blah." Get it checked, commit it. That night at 3 a.m., I wake up and think, that pointer can never be null. <laughs> there is no code path through any of the code that I've ever looked at that allows that pointer to be null. This cannot happen. And that sort of kicked over a rock, which underneath was so many cockroaches. And that just ended up, we, we found a whole host of bugs. Um, we started to fix them. And then at that point, I said, you know what? This is, this is such a, a weird bug and so common, maybe we should check if Windows has the same bug. <laughs> and that's really what, and, and then I, you know, about a day later, I get a phone call from Metz in Germany saying, it's bad. <laughs> I'm like, does Windows have the same bug? He said, no, it's worse. <laughs> and in a 300 line Python script, he had code that could um, spoof being a domain controller hijack a connection, create an admin user, suck down the entire password database, delete the user and close it again, and the person who was logging in would never know that they had been compromised. In fact, Good. if you look at the, if you remember, do you remember the Italian security company that got wiped off the map by that, that hacker guy? He published their entire internal tools. So, so the guy who did that, he posted, did a pastebin post of how he'd done it. And he'd essentially used exactly the same technique. He'd compromised an external router. He'd sat there waiting for Active Directory credentials going past. He'd hijacked it. He'd taken their entire password database out. And then he'd started slowly but surely downloading every single file they had. And so, you know, it was a bad bug. <laughs> so, and yeah. things like that happen. You know, back to the things like that happen where. You know, yes, so yes. Fortunately, yeah. so that, router, systems, that router would have almost certainly have been abandoned where somebody well, deployed it, never updated it. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's kind of the issue. I, I guess. I don't I, know how to fix that. What do you, yeah, what do you think about that? There was I, a I think Justin it's horrible when it's going to get worse. <laughs> great post on IoT and abandoned where actually today, yeah. I think, or yesterday. I don't know. He's in Australia. Who can tell what day? But. Um, <laughs> You know, what do we do about this as an industry yeah. with open source software and... and well, it, it, it's not so much open source. I mean, proprietary software can suffer from the same thing. But proprietary, uh, um, there was a wonderful post, actually, a, a while ago that basically said that, um, I can't remember who made it, but they said that people understand that the value of software is in maintenance. Because if you have a game or whatever uh, that's, that's being sold for 50 bucks and the company goes bust, you know, that game is still the same game the next day that it was the day before. And yet it's in the bargain bin at 10 bucks, <laughs> right? You know, immediately the company that goes bust that supports it, the value of the software drops through the floor because people implicitly understand that the value of software is in the support. 
the software itself is essentially worthless. Um, you know, unless this really is the open source model, the value is in support and maintaining that software. Um, but the problem of deployment, I got no clue how to fix that. That's, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, I wish I'd... I just add a comment to that, I think. Yeah. And that's, it's all well and good having that as a model, but so much stuff comes out now where it gets upgraded, updated, and changed. And you, rather than getting something that's maintaining the code, you're getting people who are producing new new releases of things that change it completely. So you so you know I, the stuff that I don't touch and don't upgrade because I don't want a new version where I now can't find half the features or yeah. stuff added that I didn't want or it goes slower than the previous version did. So there's a there's a there's a fine line between changes for maintenance and changes for feature sets. Sure, but I mean that's that's where essentially you have to have a relationship with your supplier, and that's where I like to think that the Samba team is a sort of trusted supplier that, you know, we're not going to put something out there that will break yeah. everybody's stuff. Well, occasionally we do, but everybody does that. <laughs> and, and if we do, we call it a brown paper bag release and we'll ship a fix almost immediately. Uh, so it, it's a matter of having a relationship with the people who build the <coughs> software because <coughs> software just sucks. I mean, it just does. It's awful and it's, as far as I can see, until we get rid of C and a lot of the, you know, C++ and the memory and constrained languages, it's going to keep being terrible. Um, at, at, the end, at the end of my interview for these poor kids, I always tell them, if you've learned one thing out of this interview, the one thing I want you to learn is don't write network-facing code in C. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> you know, choose anything else. Java's fine if you have to. Just don't write network-facing code in C. Yeah. Say Java's fine. Yeah, you did. Uh, if, yeah, Java's fine that. if you're writing network facing code because at least you can't have the kind of bugs. I, once we're off camera, I, I, I can give you my favorite interview question and we'll see how you do if you like. <laughs> <coughs> and at the end of it, you'll realize why you should never write network facing code in C. Well, pretty much every modern language has much better memory management. And no, even C++. Uh, you, can, you can do the same horrible bugs in C++ uh, or, or any of the others. You have, to have, you have to have a language that protects you from raw pointers and raw memory um, manipulation. Yeah. And, and like I say, Rust and, and Go, and I'm sure there's all sorts of weird Lisp-inspired stuff. You know, the Lisp guys are in the corner <coughs> smoking a joint going, yeah, we knew this in the 80s, man. <laughs> 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 Screw those guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's slow, right? Yeah. <laughs>